It's good to see everyone here this evening. As I was speaking to a few people in the back of the auditorium, a not-so-young sister, very politely, she said with a little bit of humor, she said, I believe even the dead could hear you. She said, I'm deaf and I hear you, but I believe the dead could hear you. No, it's nice to be able to talk and to cut up a little bit, to fellowship and to catch up with old friends and a new few faces that are, that are new. <clears throat> but this series of meetings this week, I hope, will be profitable to all of us. And each evening, we're going to center on that text as a springboard. And we're going to go then to the assigned text of the evening. The theme has been 1 Peter 4 and verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. The Bible says that we therefore are to have the same mind. We are to arm ourselves with the same mind. And in doing so, those that have with the flesh suffered hath ceased from sin. We talked about that this morning. There's a lot of people in the church that still live in sin. Here's the trouble. It's not enough for us to point out what is wrong. Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, a host of other sections of Scripture categorize and give us a plain list of things that are wrong. But we need not only the encouragement and the motivation, but we have to have, according to 1 Peter 4 and 1, the like mind of Christ to be able to overcome the things of Satan. The text says we are to arm ourselves. And there is no way to arm ourselves outside of the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be also in you. So hopefully every evening we're going to look at a passage, a point, a principle, and we will help cultivate our inner man to be able to have the type of mind that will be able to conform and to associate and in an intimate way understand the sufferings of Christ that I might be willing to suffer in his name and that means to undergo, to feel, to experience, to live in such a way through the teachings of the New Testament that my mind, my mind will be different and if my mind is not different there's no way I can cease from sin. Tonight we come to James, the fourth chapter, and the tenth verse, wherein the Bible says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Humility. If we go to places like Vines or Thayer's, we can understand that means abasement. Uh, not a basement, but to be abased, to be lowered. That is to willingly take upon a servant role not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to condescend just as Christ left the powers above, the, the, the ivory palaces, the, the grand beauty of heaven, and willingly came to execute the Father's will, being born of a virgin, Isaiah 7 and 14, left the palaces of heaven. He came down that we might live with him eternally. We have to be able to recognize that we, like our Lord, are to be servants of all. One of the interesting things about Christ, our beloved King, He's not a King like, like you would think. He's not a King that was unwilling to set aside, to set aside His powers and become and fashion Himself like a man. That's the teaching of Philippians 2. That's the doctrine of humility. He didn't cast off his deity like some people think. Oh, no. He was all God and all man. But he willingly chose not to utilize the power of that deity that he, through his provisions of the flesh, that he suffered once for the sins of many, might give his life a ransom for all. Now, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He being our Lord, we therefore surrender and become servants of his. Not only are we to serve Christ, but we serve our fellow man. Mark 10 and 45 makes it plain. 
He did not come to be served, but to serve, to lay down his life for all. This evening, I hope that you'll go with us through this teaching on humility. Now, I want us this evening to make application, and by application, I said this morning, that's really where preaching takes on life. When we actually start discussing things that we're dealing with in life and the proper application of the text. Remember, you have to exegete it properly. Take out of the text what the inspired author had in mind. Well, I'm positive. In James 4 and 10, we're taking out what is right. We are to be humble people. We are to be servants of God. We are to willingly, willingly do that. And at the right time, God will exalt us. We are not to exalt ourselves. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We are to be a servant of Christ. We are to humble ourselves. That's the teaching of James 4. It's not overly complicated. You know what? The Bible overall is not overly complicated. Oh, there's some secret things, right? Deuteronomy 29, 29 that belong to God. There are some things that Paul said in 2nd, excuse me, Peter, uh, referencing Paul in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16 that are hard to be understood. But the bulk of the scripture, the canon itself, was written that people might come to a fellowship with God through the living Savior Christ. And we can't overcome sin without the blood of Christ. And we can't overcome sin unless we have the mind of the sufferings of Christ. 1 Peter 4 and 1. And one of those things that we're going to arm ourselves with, if we want to have his mind, I don't know anything better to start with than the doctrine of humility. And when Philippians 2 says that he fashioned himself and became obedient, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even, yea, to the death of the cross. Young people, do you see the connection between humility and obedience? You can't just obey God in those difficult moments if you're not prepared in your mind to obey him. How difficult would it have been for Christ to have stated the prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine. Did he instantly have that type of discipline and power or had that been a long time in prayer and training and discipline to his life? Christ set the right example. He had been in personal ministry three years. His whole life was moving towards that point. Young people, listen, there's going to be things in this life that are hard decisions as you grow older. Older folks, it's not just the young people. You're going to be tested and tried, and there's going to be crucial times in your life that you have to make decisions that are very, very difficult. If we don't prepare our hearts tonight, and we don't start bringing our bodies under subjection, as Paul would say, if we don't humble ourselves in the presence of God, our heart will not be right to make the correct decision. Jesus himself said, if you look at a man, you shall know him by his fruits. But really, his heart, Jesus said, out of the mouth, out of the heart, proceedeth all kinds of things. And that's why this week, it's not just about telling us what's wrong. Oh, there's a lot of things wrong. I could make a real quick list. A lot of you'd be gasping for air. And we're going to talk about some of those things this week. Y'all know we shouldn't be drinking. That's a whole sermon. But just the whole tenure of scripture. Christians aren't called to drink alcohol. We're to abstain from those types of things. 1 Peter 5, 8 says be sober. And sober means abstinence. Abstain from it. Because your mind's got to be clear when you're fighting Satan. You've got to arm yourselves. You've got to have the mind of Christ, could you imagine? I was preaching one time. Matthew said, Jesus changed the water to wine. Well, somebody's not studying. Exegesis is taking out of the passage the author had in mind. Jesus didn't take and change water into alcoholic wine because he'd have been in violation of Habakkuk. Now, that's just one example. We could go through all kinds of things, but here's what I've come to the conclusion of, Brother Drew. People are struggling, not merely, I mean, we got to teach what's wrong, yes, very clearly. But then we're going to have to help people through Scripture arm themselves so they can have the mind of Christ so they can see what is right and wrong, discern, 
and be able to call good, good, and evil, evil. Because in Isaiah 5 and 20, they were confused. They were calling good, evil, and evil, good. So yes, you have to know right from wrong, but then you have to have the heart, the disposition to put the will of God over your own will. It's hard, brethren, when you pull in to that convenience store and you've been used to hitting one every once in a while and that urge kind of hits you, now you're going to have to reach deep down in the recesses of your heart and decide, am I going to have the mind of Christ and resist it, the evil, or am I going to allow the evil to overcome me? You better arm yourselves. And that's just one thing. We could talk all night about various things. But we're dealing with the heart and humility. Some people don't realize it. Humility is necessary to obey. Jesus said, or Paul said, of Christ, that his humility led him to obey the Father in the death of the cross. We want to have that mind tonight. I want to talk about something else while we're here. There's a lot of preachers here tonight. I'm not a young preacher anymore. I consider myself probably middle-aged. We need young preachers. Would you not agree? We need a lot of young preachers, but young preachers when you start and young men when you give talks, I want to encourage you to think about this. The first thing you've got to do and to work on is not just the lesson you're preparing, but you've got to work on having the mind and disposition likened unto Christ. That's the difference between, like I said this morning, starting out in a blaze of glory and going off into all kinds of immorality than staying stable and faithful of a lifetime of service. Your mind has to be right. If the well is poisoned, then what comes out of it is eventually going to be poisoned. Well, here's why I bring this up. You got confusion today in a lot of places. You're fortunate here at Willette. You have a consistent, steady diet of sound doctrine. Not every place like that in Oklahoma. And I'm sure there's places around here that, that's similar, that, that they struggle. And, and it's in part because people are not on the same page. I saw something recently. Someone said, well, we can just agree to disagree. We don't have to speak the same thing. We don't have to be uniform in our doctrine to have unity. Well, I mean, I appreciate people being spiritual in the sense that they're talking about spiritual things. But as an evangelist, young people, when you really decide to become a preacher, it is your God-given duty to do the work of an evangelist, 2 Timothy 4, 5. And that means that you have to address things from the scriptural point. Now let's look at the scripture and remember humility means I, I, I can't overly exaggerate my thoughts. I can't take my thoughts and place them above the will of God. I have to therefore as a preacher go to the word of God and digest and to communicate and to deliver what God says on the matter even if you or I don't necessarily immediately agree with it. That's preaching. Preaching is not designed to tell you what you already agree or believe. Preaching is designed to take you to truth, so long as the preacher is a preacher of truth. Go to 1 Corinthians number 10. Someone said that we can all believe differently on all kinds of topics. Now, first of all, I call that a straw man. They say, well, listen, nobody agrees with everything in life. So we can just agree to disagree. Well, they're creating something that's really a myth. It, it, it's a straw. Let's look at what the Bible actually says. I beseech you, brethren, that you speak the same thing. Young people, are you listening to the text tonight? Put your nose in the book and look at it. I beseech you, brethren, that you speak the same thing and that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Could you imagine how confusing it would be? You have here six elders now, I think. Could you imagine how confusing it would be having six elders over a congregation and all six of them disagree on the topic of baptism? 
One says, well, I think you ought to be baptized to be saved. The other one says, well, I think you should be, but I'm not going to say you have to be. The third one says, well, I'll split the difference and let's just agree to disagree on it and not discuss it. The fourth one says, well, I'm not so concerned about whether or not it's necessary. I'm more concerned about can we sprinkle or pour. And the fifth one, just, I'll tell you what, brethren, when it gets to that point, the church is in such a mess as it begins to, dw- to die and to dwindle. It is ludicrous to think that we are not supposed to study and come to the same conclusion on doctrinal matters. Some guy recently said, well, he asked the question, well, what are the things that we have to agree on? Well, first of all, we could start with Ephesians, the fourth chapter. The Bible here gives an irrefutable platform for unity based upon a doctrinal teaching of a foundational concept all the way from one faith and one baptism, one Lord. But I want you to notice tonight one of those that does not get discussed much. One hope. You all know why I'm bringing up one hope tonight. Because we have in a lot of places, in Texas, Oklahoma, and I was telling the elders on my way up here that Over the last two or three weeks, I have had about a dozen, roughly, people from around this area ask me the same question. Something to the effect of, what is your opinion on uh, the rejuvenated or remodeled earth, heaven on earth? And secondly, would it be a fellowship issue? Well, first of all, my opinion wouldn't count. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach? What does the New Testament authorize? But secondly, we need to make sure that we are not again putting our own thoughts into something and say, well, look, don't worry about that so-and-so because that's not a fellowship issue, somebody says. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The only one that gets to decide whether something is a fellowship issue or not is who? God. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 4 and 5, one of the seven ones, there is how many hopes? One hope. Do you know what hope is? Hope is the earnest expectation. In a ship, hope is the anchor. Hebrews talks about it's the anchor of the soul. There's faith, hope, and love, 1 Corinthians 13 says. And the greatest of these is love. What would life be without hope? Hope is something, according to the book of Romans, that we're saved by. Not alone, but it's part of our salvation. You're saved by hope. Hope is crucial. Now, if you'll notice, if we were talking about baptism, people would be right there with you. But I'm going to tell you, brethren, something. Don't mess with the doctrine of heaven. Because heaven is associated with your reward and your hope, this lively hope that ties to the resurrection, that ties to the eternal reward. It's a promise to be received and therefore part of the gospel message. If one refutes the doctrine of heaven or attempts to rest it to make it earthly and mundane and fleshly, he has taken that which is true and turned it into some form of a lie. Now we're going to see from the text tonight, heaven will not be on this earth. We're not staying on this earth. So we'll say, well, we know that preacher. It's going to be remodeled. No, it's not going to be remodeled. It's going to be burned up. I'm going to tell you all in 2 Peter 3.10, the latter part of the passage where it says, shall be burned up. The ESV renders that differently. The NIV renders that differently. That's true, but I don't use the ESV. I don't use the NIV. And I could get into a long half-hour discussion on the textual variance, but it is not proper. And the New World Translation, that's our Jehovah's Witness friends, agree with the ESV and the NIV, and they say it means either exposed or laid bare. But that's not what the text says. It shall be burned up. Well, even science will tell you, any of you are science people, True science says that matter goes to what? A lesser state. This earth is not going to be remodeled and reinvented and rejuvenated. The earth and the works therein shall be burned up. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Someone said, well, how do you deal with that? You just said heaven's going to pass away. No, because there's three heavens. So we got to be educated. 
There's three heavens. Now, I didn't say three levels. I didn't say three levels. Paul said he was caught up to what? The third heaven. What's the third heaven? Where God the Father dwells. What's the first heaven? Where the birds fly, the atmosphere. What's the second heaven? The cosmos. Heaven, the immediate atmosphere and the cosmos along with the earth are going to be dissolved, brought to an end. Because God did not, God did not have it in his creation mind, in his engineering wisdom. He did not have it that this earth would be forever or an eternal point. Folks, even the common and basic natural reading of the text from Genesis to Revelation would indicate that. From the book of Hebrews, what do the scriptures say? We are what? Strangers and pilgrims. Looking for a better country, which is a heavenly country. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. We are to look to Christ that sitteth at the right hand of the Father in the heaven. In other words, all of those passages. Think about John 14. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you. Now, where was he on earth? Where was he going? Heaven. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will do what? Come again. To receive you, that you may be where I am also. Where is Christ seated right now? Well, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And of course, in their defense, they would say yes. But eventually, heaven comes down to earth. No, heaven does not come down to earth. The earth and the heavenly realm, as far as the atmosphere and the cosmos, will be dissolved. Hopefully I can come back one of these days in this area, next time I'm in this area. Maybe it would be good to do a whole meeting or seminar on end time events, eschatology, and have a whole sermon or maybe two dedicated to this one topic. I would like to bring a workbook with me, maybe give it out so everybody could be positively clear that heaven is not going to be on this earth. Brother, let me tell you something. It don't sound like, said, well, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. When you start tampering with scripture, there's no end to it. Some, not all, I know I, I live in Oklahoma, we deal with this. Some, listen carefully, not all of my friends, they're not my running buddies anymore. Hey, you, my running buddy's got to be sound, right? Some now believe in annihilation with hell. But in their defense, I asked those, I said, well, now wait a minute. Y'all gave them a pass on heaven. Why don't they get a pass on hell? So you can imagine a preacher now, he believes that heaven's going to be on earth and he does not believe in the doctrine of eternal punishment. Well, now you have heaven and hell completely stripped as they are spoken in the scripture. What kind of preaching is going to have the same effect without a true heaven and a true hell? No, the gospel has promises to be received. The gospel has warnings to be heeded. The gospel has facts to be believed and commands to be obeyed. And by tampering with any of these things, we definitely create a problem in fellowship. Here's why I know. The Bible says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's teaching. We are not to go beyond that which is written, 1 Corinthians 4 and number 6. Now, in Paul's writings, in chapter 4 and verse 14, he would even say, I don't speak these things to shame you. I speak these things to warn you. Actually, he said, write. I write these things to warn you. There's no shame in addressing the topic. The idea is that we are to be warned because what is happening, men like N.T. Wright, and I don't want you to go home and look him up and read all his material. Because most people, I'm telling you, they, it's beyond, if you don't have truth, that's why a lot of people are overtaken. But these supposed academic scholars are speaking at some of our universities and these young men and women go home and they're enamored with it and they fall in love with it. 
Someone criticized me recently. They said, well, Brant wouldn't have you listen to any denominational theologian. No, I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't. Let me ask you a question. Now I can preach a little. Let me ask you a question. Why would I have you go to somebody on the doctrine of heaven if they don't even believe in baptism for the remission of sins? What is a scholar? You ever thought about that question? Humble ourselves. We don't need doctors and PhDs. If I had a PhD, when I came here, I would be brother. By relationship of family, never elevate myself in a sense of a secular accolade. There is nobody among our people that is elevated above another as far as the value. That's how, how do you think Catholicism began? It basically denies the people the ability to the text. It elevates a few and makes it be where the common man cannot understand the Bible. You can understand the Bible. And when Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, where I am, there ye may be also, who in their right mind would think that's talking about earth? Someone said, well, one of the possible definitions of the word groaneth in Romans 8 in the Greek could possibly, now wait a minute, you're going to take an obscure definition of a word and go against the natural teaching of the entire continuity of the New Testament and override all of that? That's becoming foolish. That's what's wrong. Young preachers, the first thing you've got to have when preaching is common sense. I don't know why they called it common, Brother Scoggins. It's not so common. Heaven and hell. The reason these topics are a fellowship issue, if nothing else, is because the Bible says contending earnestly for the what? Faith. That's not personal faith. That's objective put for the system of Christianity. We are to humble ourselves. What does that mean? We are not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. So just because I have read some man's book that calls himself a scholar does not mean that I have this newfound idea that no other gospel preacher in this area had ever learned for years and years. Think about it. What would be the chance of some young, I'll say you're young still. Now this guy's sound. He's, he's sound. But, but, but let's say he thought he had found something that no other gospel preacher had ever found. But do y'all buy that? Oh, you might have some little nugget or gem or nuance, but I mean, you're not going to have any new major point. I can't think of anything that I teach that I have found as new and undiscovered. Nothing. Does anybody here, any man, we'll let the women keep silent, does any man have any completely new point that none of us know about? Now, don't, don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> no, because the gospel's not that way. The gospel does not depend on my intellect alone. Do you see this? The gospel does not depend upon some mysterious uh, coming to, to some mathematical formula to find something out or, or, or some nuance of a word, to some, none of those things. Heaven on earth, like many other false doctrines, destroys the faith because it takes people down a wrong path. And once you question one tenet of the faith, and once you leave one, thus saith the Lord... I have never known a person in my entire life that did that, that stopped with one. Never. If they leave the truth on marriage and divorce and remarriage, eventually they leave it on something else. And here's why. Because to be able to have a proper exegesis of Scripture, you have to have a right mind. And once your mind is not geared a certain way looking at the Scripture, then you're developing a habit to allow your mind to go places where it should not go. You have to keep your mind straight. That's the most important thing in Bible study. 
That's why we're talking about humility. Young preachers, don't get upset. Elders are to bring correction to improper teaching. I remember one time when I was, I was young, I was preaching. I didn't mean anything by it, but I was wrong. And I threw out a word, and what I said was, well, the stuff, some stuff in Scripture. And old Brother Shinner, right, he's gone. I never will forget, he came up and he said, let's don't refer to the Scripture as stuff. I understand, thank you. But see, in other words, he had the right and really was doing his job to remind me and help mold me. What we have today is we have the pastor system developing. We have preachers that think that when they espouse something and people get upset, then they play the victim. Oh, poor me. Or my elders are too hard on me. Wait a minute. Elders are supposed to guard the flock. Elders are supposed to make sure that the preacher is preaching sound doctrine. The elders here should be a check and balance to me to make sure what I'm conveying is right. And if there's something misquoted or inhonest, uh, misapplied, okay, we'll deal with it. Preachers have to learn to be humble as much as any people. So part of humility means that I'm not going to go beyond what is written. I'm not going to get into speculation. I'm not going to go beyond what the Bible actually says because in doing so, I'm creating a problem for the entire church. I'm setting a precedent. Our people, by our people I mean the Lord's elect, the church. In years gone past, more so than now, I would like to see us rekindle this fervor. We were known as a people that were Bible-toting, Scripture-quoting, great fervor, going by the Bible and calling Bible things by Bible names. In fact, on many websites, on many signs when I was growing up in Oklahoma, a lot of those are gone now. It would say on the sign, speaking where the Bible speaks, being silent where the Bible is silent. You know, the latter part of that slogan is now being questioned by a lot of people. A lot of times when I'm studying with people, they will say this. Well, the Bible doesn't say I can't do such and such. We need to readdress this. You know what humility is? Humility is not going beyond, what did we say earlier? 1 Corinthians 4 and 6. Not going beyond that which is written. The Bible doesn't have to tell you everything not to do. You have to have authority, Colossians 3 and 17, to do it. Whatsoever you do, young people, in word or in deed, do all in the name, the authority of Christ Jesus giving thanks unto the Father through or by Him. We're supposed to make sure that God gives us a green light. Here's why. Could you imagine the chaos in religion? Could you imagine the realm of confusion in the church if everybody was allowed to just insert their own thought and opinion in worship? It'd be devastating. That's why when you go on social media, if y'all ever scroll through the little videos, some of these religious places, some of the things that go on, I, I, I just have to turn it off. It will give me a heart attack. I saw one, they was jumping completely over the pews. I thought, could you imagine? Well, how'd that get? Well, show me in the Bible where it says you can't jump over a pew. The way it condemns it is by telling us what to do. Let all things be done decently and in order. We need to recognize the people of God, the humility, that's tonight's lesson. That that plays a huge part in arming ourselves to have the right mind of Christ. So when you're a young preacher studying to learn how to become a Christian, when you're a wife at home to your husband, when you're a man on the job representing your family and the church and your community, wherever you're at during the week, your disposition could lead somebody to Christ or it could hinder or turn somebody away from Christ. Humility is not weakness. Humility is not passiveness. 
addressing a problem is not against humility. One time I was preaching on something, I can't think of even what it was now, but somebody said, well, humility means we don't just confront things outright. That's not true. No, it needs to be from a level of passion and love, obviously, but we have to address what is wrong. I mean, the next time your teenager acts up and they come in and tell you you can't address them because that wouldn't be humble, what would you tell them? Isn't it funny, Brother Kenny, how we act and think in religion is so different than in other aspects of our life? Could you imagine in a business? Let's say you had an employee and they was embezzling money. You had a problem. You and the accountant come and, and you're going to address the situation. The employee says, now, I don't think Jesus, I, I don't think he would do that. I don't think he would confront me like that. We have a problem in America. People play the victim mentality too much. Yes, we should be as kind as possible, sure. But we have to address things. Humility is not passiveness. Humility is the willingness to subject ourselves to the will of God, not think too highly of ourselves, and do what is best as a servant for the cause of Christ and my fellow man. That means I'm willing to sacrifice for you. Somebody wants to stay up tonight and study the Bible? Yeah, I'm a little tired the last few days, but guess what? We will stay up and we will study the Bible because that is more important than my sleep. Preachers, you've got to learn to sacrifice too. As we get ready to close this lesson, now by close, that gives me 15 minutes. I want to ask a question. If the Lord was to come in the clouds of glory, y'all know he's not coming back to this earth. There's a reason he's not coming back to this earth. We already covered that. Because the earth and the works therein shall be burned up. He is coming to meet us in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. Amos, the old country preacher, said, Prepare, Amos 4, 12, to meet thy God. I want to ask a real question. Are you prepared to meet God tonight? And I don't mean... Just some emotional appeal. You know, I've known some preachers, they, I mean, they put it on and guilt trip people. No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to turn this into some circus. But I want your mind to ask a question to itself. Are you right with God? This is why we have gospel meetings. To encourage the saved. To call the sinners to repentance to edify the church, to rekindle our zeal, to build one another up. Isn't it a beautiful sight tonight to see all the different brethren here? What a fellowship in the church of Christ. If you're not in the church of Christ, look around. All these people could be your family. One of the greatest things about the church of Christ is that all of these, nobody here has the right to turn anybody down. As long as they come to the invitation of Christ by the terms of Christ. We don't vote you. I mean, could you imagine going to some place, with all due respect, could you imagine going to some Baptist church and they voting on you? Say, no, I don't like him. He farmed the place next to me and never kept the fence up. I'd just soon not have him. There's people that are that petty in life. You see why God didn't leave it to mankind to decide who gets to come in and who doesn't. Who gets to come in? The man that by faith repents, confesses, and is baptized into Christ. That's the man that gets to come in. And we'll welcome him gladly if we're any man at all. Part of humility means we have to recognize that there is no ability in self to sustain self. Now this is hard. And it's hard for me. When you live out in Oklahoma, you kind of have to become a little bit independent and rugged. You know, we, we don't have, um, most of our land, we don't have water like you all have here. We have to drill a water well. Now, those water wells are tricky. They're always giving you trouble. You might go out there and the cattle have no water. Well, you better know how to fix your own water well because the, the guys that do that professionally, I mean... They, they kind of know. There's only two or three of them around. You have to learn how to repair your own water well. 
or you're going to be in trouble. That's just one small thing. It's all, the further you go west, I mean, it's kind of a rugged area. But even in Tennessee, in the south, people are taught, and rightfully so, a strong work ethic. But if we're not careful, that can flood into our mind and our emotions, and we can actually begin to think that our security and our ability to be independent flows over into our spiritual mind and that we actually are okay somehow because we are this independent, rugged, secure person that in our minds, although we don't say it, the thought is there that somehow we are, well, we made it. We're here. We're standing. We have to see ourselves in need of a Savior before there's any need in talking about how to be saved. You have to see yourself in need of a Savior. Some of you women, don't raise your hand. I, I, I always say that now. Years ago, some lady, she was getting her husband in trouble and she raised her hand. I thought, oh no. Some ladies have to deal with a monster at home. Ladies, until your husband humbles himself and he realizes where he stands in the creation order, that he is not the creator, he is the created, and that he needs to humble himself, he'll never be the right kind of husband to you. I'm just telling you. You cannot by yourself change him. You can live a life, 1 Peter 3, 1, that helps to bring that to fruition by your example, but I'm saying he has to have humility Unless he has the mind of Christ, he'll never be the right kind of husband. Some people are here tonight. Do you want a better family? Yeah, Ten more minutes. I'll move quick, but listen, this is important. Even if you did not become a Christian, if you embraced the characteristics of Christ to some extent, it would help your home life, right? Now, you still wouldn't be saved, but when you follow the teachings of Christ, it starts to make you into a different person. Now look, but I don't want to make you just a better man or a father through the gospel teaching. We want God through Christ to bring you into a new creature so now you can be not just a little bit better, but you can be the man of God that he's always wanted you to be. God wants you to be that. God is not desiring that any should perish. He doesn't want you to be any less than what you can be in your potential spiritually. He needs more men to be deacons and elders and to stand in the gap and to teach and to be good citizens of the kingdom. He needs more sisters and ladies in the church. But God is not going to alter his plan for anybody. Someone says, well, I own the local bank in town. Yeah, well, so what? If you're not baptized and obey the gospel, I mean, it's not going to do you any good. Enjoy it while you're here. Because the scripture says the pleasures of sin are enjoyable. Go ahead and enjoy them. Because it's coming to an end. I hope there's somebody here tonight that's really listening to this. I pray personally for you that you would consider Christ that your life could be changed. I wish you could understand. Really, you can't. Brother Clark, is it not? So, it's just hard to put into words. When you become a Christian, the change, you take an older man like that that's been a Christian all those years, the wisdom that a person receives, it's hard to put in words what Christ can do for you. Part of preaching, Jaden, is not just informing the brethren what to do. It's also motivating them and encouraging them to do it. Sometimes our invitations have become something that we're so accustomed to. You know, they said, well, get the book out and we sing the song. Does the Spirit convict you through the Word of God? Does He press upon your heart through the teaching of the gospel, the things of the Lord? Does it cause you to reconsider and evaluate every time I preach? I'll promise you I'm evaluating myself right now. And I can see in my life many things that I must, must do better. But I know this. 
that I am a Christian by the grace of God through my faithful obedience. I obeyed the gospel and the gospel saves sinners. And tonight, if you're here, would you believe and do you believe strongly that Christ is the son of the living God? Oh, I believe that more now than ever. I believe that he came to earth and died to set men free from sin. Do you and are you willing to repent? Now, here, here's, here's the difficult part. Repentance means there are some changes that you're going to have to make. Don't try to justify your sin. Come to Christ in penitence. It doesn't matter what you've done. You committed murder, guess what he'll do? When you obey the gospel, he'll forgive you if you repent. You committed adultery, you might have slept with 10 women in this county. He'll forgive you if you really repent. Now repentance, if I take, I guess y'all are married. If I take this woman, she leaves him for me. Now repentance means she's got to go back. I can't keep her. Y'all understand that? When I say repentance, I don't mean just confessing sin. I mean you have to give up what is wrong. I can't keep another man's wife. Sit in front of him in the church house and turn around and smile and say, so glad we're brothers. No, repentance means I have to give her back. I've always said baptism is not that difficult. That's passive. It's something being done to you. You submit to it in humility. The difficulty is in repentance. That man that's a monster at home, you better go home and tell your wife you're sorry. You clean your act up. That man that's a drunkard, his kids grew up without the attention of the father. They saw him as a slobbering, hopeless drunk. Go home and you apologize to your children. And if they're grown and they've left the home, you go apologize to them. You put the bottle down. You be the kind of man that God would have you to be. If this country had a wide-scale order of repentance all across our land, what would happen? Oh, God would bless us. Church houses would be full. I mean the real church, the church of Christ. Our meeting houses would be full. Believe, repent, confess with the mouth. And I know that confession today to some folk, they see it more as a formality. But look, it's more than a formality. In the, in the younger years of Christianity, it cost a lot of our ancestors their lives. We're able today to confess that freely without much persecution, but I'm afraid the time is coming. That may not be so. Be baptized tonight to wash away your sins. Last passage, Acts 22 and 16. Someone said, well, no, calling on the name of the Lord is how you're saved. Look at the passage. Arise, be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's called a simultaneous participle. And here's what that means. The same time you are being baptized... Is the same time in which your sins are being washed away. Baptism is a reenactment of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we all agree we're saved by the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Christ saves. Baptism is the reenactment of it. A simultaneous participle, if you want the grammatical explanation. But all you need to do is let God through Christ wash your sins as you submit to Him in baptism. I hope and pray the lesson has fa fallen, excuse me, on hearts that are honest. And if there's somebody here tonight that is a Christian and you've wandered away, these elders are ready to come to take your confession and for you to be restored. You know, I'll promise you, you know if you have a good heart if you need to be restored. You come in prayer, repentance, and confession as we stand and as we sing. <clears throat>